and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our fireside chat with the editors of the special issue of Feminist Economics on COVID-19. My name is Jessica Spinoza. I'm the chair of the online events committee, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this really exciting event today, which is the first in a new series of fireside chats organized by the online events committee. This event is being recorded and we have disabled the public chat, but you can send your questions to the host. And now without further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to our moderator today, Elisa Brownstein, the journal editor. Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, and thank you to the online events committee for organizing this fireside chat which I understand is the first in a series of chats about the special issue and future chats will feature um, authors, uh, contributing authors to the special issue. So I'm happy to announce that all 27 articles for the special double issue of feminist economics, uh, feminist economic perspectives on the COVID-19 pandemic are now published online. Uh, this issue is a little different in that articles are about half the length of standard journal, uh, feminist economics journal articles. We wanted to be able to publish many contributions quickly. And we ended up getting so many great submissions that we turned the special issue into not one, but two issues. So issue one and two of 2021 are devoted to the special issue. Now, all of the articles are published online. The special issue proper, as in the paginated volume 27, issues one and two with a table of contents will be released by the end of next week. But I wanted to have all of the articles available to you by today, by this webinar. I also wanna note that all of the articles are free access through July, 2021. So uh, please avail yourselves of that benefit as soon as you can. It's a tremendously interesting set of articles. And I also wanted to recognize the big collective effort that went into making this special issue happen, uh, both in terms of reviewers, which included many associate editors and editorial board folks and IAPI members who worked very quickly uh, fielding requests at a moment, especially when the pandemic came bearing down. Uh, but also a big heartfelt thank you to the guest editors for all of your work, which was so concentrated, so fast and so much. <laughs> thank you for contributing that to our community. And so now I wanna to turn to introducing the guest editor team, all of whom are also associate editors for the journal. First, we have Nyla Kabir, who's a professor of gender and development at the Department of Gender Studies and the Department of International Development at the London, London School of Economics, also past president of IAPI, uh, a leading and entertaining writer on gender empowerment, poverty, social exclusion, and social protection, labor markets, and livelihoods. Uh, and as well as being entertaining, I find her to be very provocative in the best way. So welcome, Nyla. Uh, Shah Razavi, who's the director of the Social Protection Department at the International Labor Organization in Geneva, formerly the chief of research and data at UN Women in New York, and before that, the research coordinator for the UN Research Institute for Social Development. She is a leading scholar on the political and social organization of care, providing important in inputs into how gender has been incorporated most recently into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And she's really my go-to person for questions on care and social protection. If Shara thinks it's okay, then I know it's okay. Um, and then the third, uh, uh, Guest editor is Jana van der Meulen Rogers, who's a professor in the Labor Studies and Employment Relations Department and in the Women and Gender Studies Department at Rutgers University. 
She's also past president of IAFI and works on questions of health, development, labor studies, and feminist economics. And I think her work in particular, among many other things, is an excellent example of how to do data analysis well from a feminist perspective. And she co-authored one of my all-time favorite feminist economics articles, Economic Importance and Statistical Significance, Guidelines for Communicating Empirical Research. So welcome to all of you. So we're organizing this as a fireside chat, meaning that we are in conversation as opposed to PowerPoint-based presentations. And so we're going to spend about 40 minutes in conversation where I'll direct uh, some questions to each of the guest editors. And then in the last part of the chat, we will take up questions from uh, the audience. So I want to start with the first question. And this one is particularly directed at Nyla, but I invite the other guest editors to chime in if they'd like to. So as I noted before, the special issue includes many papers, 26 in total, plus the introduction, covering a wide range of different topics and perspectives on the pandemic and economic crisis. So thinking about the papers as a whole, what struck you as a particularly important insight or something new you learned from editing this volume? Oh, Nyla, you're muted. That's why I didn't want to mute myself. <laughs> I always forget. So thank you. Um, what I thought was very interesting about the special issue in the collection that we got was how much of it drew on existing body of feminist economic theory, right? So in a sense, they were not necessarily telling us something new, but they were telling us how these things operate in a new environment or an unexpected environment. So it was looking at a body of economic theory through a different lens. And so the, the topics, the themes are familiar to feminist economists, you know, uh, the markets, care economy, the households. But I will say that there were two articles that kind of uh, intrigued me. And I think they intrigued the world. And that is, how women leaders have performed in, in response to the pandemic. So two of the articles actually tried to deal with that. They used cross-country regressions and compared women leaders with men leaders, and they controlled for the kinds of things that might matter. And the kinds of things they came up with were um, that you know women use budgets differently. So the, it was much more likely that the countries in which women were leaders also had quite widespread care, um, health coverage. Uh, the other was that perhaps women uh, deal with risk and uncertainty differently. So, you know, trying to compare male and female, we're into this, let's avoid essentialism, right? There's nothing essential about this, but what is it about their experiences? So one was also about risk, you know, that maybe uh, when it comes to risking people's health, women are much more cautious, they went to lockdown much quicker. Uh, they weren't willing to risk the health of people in order to keep the economy ticking over. But I think I one thing which was not, which, which struck me from what was said, but it wasn't drawn out. And that is that uh, evidence from the leadership literature suggests that good communication skills are important for women to be chosen as leaders. Now, why I thought that struck me is that does, good, does the kind of woman who becomes a leader, does she bring with her not just good communication skills, but a series of other skills? And does the kind of man who we are now seeing has become a leader in a populist era, do those men bring with them certain very negative skills? You know, the need to perform masculinity in certain ways. So it may not be particularly about men and women per se, but the kinds of people that get elected into leadership, but in this particular moment in time, that maybe we have a surfeit of, uh, you know, hyper-masculine leaders who don't want to be saying to take risks, 
you know, who don't want to acknowledge that there's something wrong, that people are weak, people are falling ill. So I, I, I've kind of struggled over that. And I kind of wanted to add that to the kind of explanations that the authors have offered. I wanted to follow up on a word that Nyla just mentioned a couple of times, and that's risk. And in thinking about one of the, the key insights that I got from editing the special issue, you know, there was a lot of focus on care. And you know, feminist economists have looked at care for decades now. Um, but I think a, another kind of black box that really hasn't been examined as much uh, until this special issue and, and what we're hearing so much in the media is essential workers, unskilled workers or low skilled workers. We sort of you know put them in, tuck them away and label them as unskilled workers. But all of a sudden during the pandemic, many you know essential workers or frontline workers turned out to be unskilled workers. And now we're using words like essential. So during this process, you know, of editing the, the special issue, I really got to thinking more about essential workers, low wage, unskilled workers, and looking more closely at, at those workers. In several articles in our special issue did, um, Nancy Fulbright and her co-authors, you know, looked at essential workers and found that uh, lower or care workers among essential workers tended to earn less. Uh, Michelle Holder and her co-authors looked at the intersectional dimension of, you know, intersection of um, uh, essential workers and found that they're more likely to be uh, women of color. So I think the special issue is really important for highlighting not only care, but also essential workers and low wage workers. One thing, though, also, these essential workers are also taking more risks. Exactly. And that so the, it's normally that seen up. as a low risk job, but they are continuing their work at huge risks to their own health. Yes, that was the point I wanted to make. And thank you. You brought it back to risk. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So drawing on sort of traditional insights, right, that feminist economic work has done, but also uncovering these new sort of themes. So I'm gonna move on to my next question, which I'm directing at Shara initially. Uh, recently, the New York Times proclaimed that US mothers are in crisis due to the COVID pandemic. We clearly could expand that to include mothers around the world. However, many feminist economists have argued that mothers have been in crisis for decades, uh, even before the pandemic. Yeah. How does the volume shed light on what many have called an emerging crisis of, of care? Do you think moving forward that there will be a new policy focus on care or will this disappear as we move from pandemic to recovery? Yeah, uh, Alyssa, this, uh, I think indeed, I mean, this uh, particular crisis, the pandemic, made uh, uh, much more visible, I think, uh, than let's say during the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, the kind of long-standing routine crises that mothers around the world have been grappling with in trying to organize care for young children. And this is something, of course, feminist economists have been researching and writing about for, for a very long time, for many decades. And locating the problem, you know, in part in the politics and economics of the family, of the household. Uh, you know, we have tons of time use research that shows that women sh shoulder the lion's share of this work. And that even when men are, you know, not the only breadwinners or not even the primary breadwinners, you know, still um, that division of that kind of care work continues to be very unequal. And also, in addition to the politics of the family, there's also been quite a lot of feminist research on this, for want of a better word, I'll just call it stinginess, you know, the stinginess of public support and public systems in, 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 uh, in supporting this kind of work, whether it's with childcare services or provision of cash or paid leave. Uh, even, even very generous welfare states become quite stingy when it gets to these issues. So I think what was really interesting during the past year, as many issues, uh, papers in this special issue showed, was the aggravation of this kind of chronic crisis. 
And because, you know, on the one part, we saw the disruption of services, you know, childcare services, schools, etc. And then uh, the fact that a lot of the paid work, you know, was also shifted into the home, at least for those who could be doing the work or teleworking, obviously not for the essential workers who had to go there and face the risks uh, and, and not even get any kind of hazard pay. Uh, and there was also, and, and we have this in the special issue, uh, an interesting question about the extent to which men within families and households started doing a bit more than they routinely would do. And I think the, the, the evidence that we have in the special issue is a bit um, sort of uh, not, not very clear on, on the extent to which changes happen. And these, yes, they are issues that feminists have been writing about, but I think the really interesting question is now that the debate and the issues are much more in the public domain, whether there is a kind of tipping point. And to answer you know, your question, are we going to see some kind of follow-up to this? I think you know, that's the really million dollar question as a result of this kind of greater public visibility. I mean, will there be policy responsiveness? And I think here we are in a way in the realm of speculation. And I mean, the only safe thing we can say is that it won't be the same in all countries. There's going to be huge diversity in terms of response. Um, and what I think is really important is that we don't have a shortage of ideas. And in this special issue, we have a great paper, a number of great papers on advocating for having a kind of care-led recovery in the context of this crisis. Uh, to be able to move out of it. Um, and as we know, you know, during this crisis, ILO figures show that we have seen about 255 million full-time jobs being lost. You know, that's about a 9% drop in uh, the global working hours. And so these papers make the case that investments, public investments in care services would be not only good in terms of responding to the rising needs and the kind of way in which in particular women shoulder these needs, but also to really kind of create the jobs that are needed and the employment stimulus of investment in care services being even bigger than investments in other kinds of you know, public infrastructure, if you like. But I think the really pivotal question is what Jana and Naila were just saying, which is about the quality of these jobs. Are we going to move kind of beyond clapping and applause and really start paying workers skilled workers, because you know that the question of skill is also a very gendered issue. Of course, some of these jobs are classified as low skilled or unskilled, but we know that you know uh, bathing an old person is a highly skilled job. You know, so so the question is really whether we're going to uh, sort of reward these jobs in the way that they should be rewarded and recognize their the skill and the value that they bring to our economies and societies. Or are we just going to continue penalizing them in terms of pay and working conditions? And here, I think, you know, and for, to, to its credit, ILO's um, sort of uh, report on care work and care jobs did a really good job in terms of uh, really underlining the importance of quality of jobs and whether care jobs are decent jobs or not. Um, so, so it'd be great to see, you know, how this is taken forward and whether at least we're going to see greater public investment. Uh, in, in care services as, as, a, uh, as a response to, to this crisis and as a way of uh, moving out of it and, and recovering from it. So let me stop there. Okay, thank you. I hope that we do see those sorts of investments. Um, other comments from Jana or Nyla before I move on? Okay. I have a, I have a quick, am I yes. muted? No, I'm not. No, no. comment to Shara. Mm -hmm. um, what we have discovered from unregulated markets and unregulated liberalization is that people can invent their own jobs. You know, they can make do somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think often this, it's set up as a quantity, quantity quality trade-off. But I think what we know is markets can create a quantity of pretty awful jobs. Yeah. So I think the, the challenge for public investment is how to create better quality jobs. Absolutely. Otherwise, why have public investment? Because people can somehow make a living, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the really, the really important question because we also have, you know, uh, public sector jobs that are not necessarily very good quality, and particularly when we look into, uh, you know, the kind of uh, frontline care services that are publicly financed. They're not necessarily well paid and the care penalty also exists in those jobs. Although, you know, as you know, feminist research shows that it's less of a penalty when it is in the public sector than when it is in the, in the, 
you know, in the private sector. So that I think will be a really important question. And I think in the context of all the debates now that are going on around, you know, the gig economy jobs platform, uh, jobs mediated by digital platforms, there is a really good questions now, I think, in the public domain about, you know, quality of jobs and the fact that no matter where and what kind of work you're doing whether you're self-employed or not you should have a basic floor in terms of the mm. kind of rights and security that should come with jobs in terms of access to health care or access to mm. you know a, a minimum pension at least uh, sick pay which became another issue of great significance during this crisis yeah mm -hmm. thank you so now i for my next question i'd like to turn to yana one difficulty in understanding the social and economic dimensions of the crisis has been the need for getting reliable data in the midst of a rapidly unfolding pandemic. Now, thinking about the articles in the volume, are there examples of new sources of information that help us to understand the impact of the crisis on women and men, such as the data from the ILO that Shara referenced on employment losses? Or, and, and what do these data show? And that was actually at the top of my list in thinking about the data that we found useful, even in writing our own introduction. Um, and I've been referring to it so many times. Uh, the ILO um, has this ILO monitor, COVID-19 and the world of work. And they uh, keep updating the additions with really valuable data on employment by gender. So we used on that to look at employment losses by gender. And the last time I checked the most recent edition, I think there was data for 18 countries. And in 15 of those countries, women's employment losses were larger than those of men. And the ILO even did a decomposition showing that uh, not only are women's losses larger, but they're also proportionately more explained by exits from the labor force Whereas men's employment losses, there's a bigger chunk accounted for by unemployment. So they're still looking for work and they're still in the labor force. And I've been referencing that as well. And then as Shara mentioned, um, there's a social protection monitor as well with extensive data on social protection responses uh, to COVID-19 all around the world. Uh, one thing that we did in our introduction in seeing all these studies coming in is we put together a table of different uh, data bases available and there are several that have um, gender disaggregated or sex disaggregated data, including UN Women and Women Count. Um, they're tracking COVID-19 cases as well as deaths, um, as well as Global Health 5050. Um, and a number of um, our authors in the special issue used other data sources, but they were able to use methods to um, come up with gendered stories. So one is uh, Google has a nice database on mobility that one of our authors used. And there's also databases that we um, describe in our uh, table on social distancing, on travel restrictions, uh, education disruptions, that's a UNESCO data set, uh, global behaviors and perceptions related to the pandemic. And we also found a couple of repositories of resources, um, especially data to X that has not only data um, that sex disaggregated, but also collections of working papers. And a number of our authors did their own surveys. And that was another lesson that I learned that you know, traditionally economists are known for using large existing data sets collected by governments and more recently doing their own experiments. But I think in the past year, a lot more of us have ventured out into collecting our own data through rapid response surveys and several authors in the special issue did that as well. Yeah, that was really interesting to me as well to look at those rapid response surveys in particular. That's exactly what you're getting, really fascinating stuff. Any other comments on this data question from Shara or Nyla? Uh, so I'll move on to my next question, which I'll direct initially at Nyla. In some cases, the pandemic seems to have reinforced traditional gender dynamics and inequalities. 
For instance, many countries have reported a significant increase in domestic violence directed at women and children. But there are also some stories of men, uh, particularly those working remotely who have taken on more unpaid work within the home. From the papers and the volume, what do we learn about the pandemic's impact on gender dynamics and inequalities? In addition to the comment you made at the beginning about uh, hyper-masculine leadership versus women's leadership and the types of people that step into those positions. Yeah. We can't get away from masculinity, whether it's in politics or at home. <laughs> and I think the overall news is not a good one. And I think the overall, the headline story is that the pandemic has intensified inequalities of all kinds, uh, intersectional inequalities. And we know that uh, people of color, migrants, you know, people who are specific, particularly vulnerable, have suffered the most and so i you know we can look for chunks of you know something to be optimistic about and so we did find one or two studies but you know we were very aware of sample bias that these were middle class couples with access to internet and so on where the domestic division of labor had become a bit more egalitarian but i think the larger story was that well, the larger story was a little complicated in that men were taking on a larger share of unpaid work compared to previously. Uh, but the pandemic has helped to disaggregate the concept of unpaid work to routine and non-routine, or to put it another way, enjoyable and less enjoyable. So we find that men are doing much more of the childcare work and you know, playing with kids and so on, which perhaps we were not doing before, and this is something the pandemic has brought on, but that women are reporting you know, far more interrupted time if they're working from home, uh, far more responsibility for the boring routine everyday stuff, and far longer hours and far more intensive uh, intensification of hours, you know, doing many more jobs. Uh, so, you know, if we thought that somehow the pandemic given that it was confronting us in the face with a crisis you know, of a kind that we'd never experienced before, might somehow jolt people into behaving a bit more democratically at home, it doesn't seem to have happened. And I think you know, while mothers with children at home obviously have had a, a specific set of additional tasks, working mothers with children at home, I think had a particularly difficult time you know, because a lot of them have to continue to work. Uh, but whether the husband is unemployed or, you know, doing part-time, somehow it has remained the responsibility. So I don't know if the others have come across more cheerful stories, but I have been very struck by the intensification of inequalities in all its dimensions, you know, gender, race, and so on, work, home, and, and so on. Thank you. Maybe just, Shara. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe just to add, I think what to what Naila said, um, and also, I mean, uh, you, you know, she's absolutely right. And the one or two positive stories we had, you know, were very um, kind of had a lot of reservations because they were small, small samples. You know, there was a bias in terms of the sample because it was based on interviews done, uh, you know, uh, on the internet. So so it's with people who have access to the internet. But I think the other the other important thing is the the way in which it actually there is much more continuity than change, because even in the extent to which the men did do work, it tended to be the more pleasurable parts of work, playing with children or going out and doing the food grocery shopping, which was also, I think, one of the findings from all the time we surveys that the, the way in which men participate often is not in doing the routine stuff. It's more in doing, you know, playing with children and doing the gardening and doing the, you know, uh, the outside mm. shopping and, and, and work of that of that sort, rather than the day-to-day -day work of, you know, homeschooling and uh, bathing mm. children and so forth. So, so there's also, again, you know, considerable continuity rather than a revolution in the whole. Uh, Jana, anything? One thing I wanted to yeah. yeah, I wanted to add, um, I like your focus in the question on the gender dynamics 
And one thing, I also did a very small scale survey just in the US and what we found, and it's consistent with some other studies is that when, and this was a survey of um, opposite sex partnerships, but when men did more uh, unpaid work in the home that contributed positively to women's paid job satisfaction and their paid job productivity, but that relationship did not hold in the opposite direction. So no matter <laughs> how much more women did at home, it had no impact on men's productivity or satisfaction. So these dynamics are really important. So that's why I love your question. Of, and, and we need to look more at these dynamics and what's happening in the interplay at home. I think also, Elisa, if I could just come in, Please. is that yeah. very fascinating study from Kazakhstan about looking at the well-being, the psychological well-being, stress, and health self-care, and how married male doctors found that being married and having children actually reduced their stress and improved their eating habits <laughs> compared to single male doctors. But married female doctors reported higher levels of stress good eating habits, but was smoking more than unmarried female doctors. So marriage has a very um, asymmetrical impact, if you like, on the well-being of working men and women. Mm -hmm. Interesting, in line with the gender dynamic sort of point that um, yeah. Jana was making. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's sort of an extension of pre-existing yes. uh, yes. uh, patterns although some, some pressure and potentially some renegotiation, but not without its stress. Okay, so next question, uh, which I wanna to direct to Yana initially. So one of the most devastating failings of many countries in confronting the pandemic has been associated with the horrific number of deaths in nursing homes and among people requiring long-term care. What do the articles in the special issue tell us about elder care and the need for a different approach going forward? Is adequate attention, in your opinion, paid to uh, elder care or does child care receive disproportionate attention? And if you could help us think about this. That's such a good question. Um, and I'm gonna start off and reference um, one of our contributors to the special issue, Nancy Fulbray. She had a really good tweet the other just a couple of days ago that you know said it all. She said um, nursing homes and long-term care facilities are deadly, and they're deadly because they operate mostly with profit-maximizing incentives. They get inadequate Medicaid reimbursement or other national insurance programs in other countries. Their staff are low-paid. They have high staff turnover and they provide poor quality care. And so I will credit Nancy with uh, that you know, set of arguments, but so many of our papers that did address care and elder care uh, in the special issue made very similar points. Um, one example of an article in the special issue, uh, Marcella Corsi and her co-authors uh, looked at Italy and they found that more elderly people died in the northern part of Italy because they were more likely to either live alone or live in nursing homes. Whereas in the southern part of Italy, um, elderly people were more likely to be cared for or looked after uh, within the home. Um, another issue I think is that older women may be less likely to seek care if they need it. And another one of our contributors, Sonia Akhtar, uh, found that in the US that um, uh, mortality statistics may even be underreported because women were less likely to seek care to begin with if they were sick. Um, also in the special issue, uh, Saskia Elise Dice uh, looked at long-term care in the Netherlands. And um, she and her co-authors found that intensive care units and other you know, parts of hospitals were favored over long-term care um, for you know, many years, not even in the pandemic when it came to the provision of personal protective equipment and other resources. 
and that contributed to the excess mortality that we've been seeing in long-term care facilities. And um, a couple of papers, and uh, Shara referenced this earlier in her reply, uh, did look at investment in the care sector. And both of those papers in our special issue looked also at you know, investment in long-term care facilities and found that these investments are good. Oh, they're a win-win situation in terms of creating employment, um, helping with uh, long-term you know, health and well-being, and um, even in terms of you know, tax revenues and other macroeconomic implications. So investing in long-term care is a win-win situation. And I do think because of the horrible you know, um, new statistics and all the media that the world has seen in the past year, that more attention is being paid now to long-term care and not just childcare. Maybe just for sure, I yeah. Yeah, maybe just to add, I think Yana's uh, response was pretty comprehensive, but I also find that quite uh, stunning, and that came out in in the paper that she referred to, you know, in Holland, which also talks about the sort of care workforce in some of these uh, long term care homes and mm -hmm. the tendency for them, as we all know, they tend to be often also people who are marginalized in other ways. Uh, you know, women of color tend to predominate uh, in in nursing homes. The kind of contracts they have, you know, are as so-called self-employed you know they're not seen as employees with all the rights that come with it and I think this hierarchy in terms of care which is kind of implicit in the question you're asking Elisa is also interesting you know the quality uh, issues and pay and reward for child care versus long-term care you know it's uh, I think it's very interesting and if you look at it from this kind of perspective of human capital I wonder if it has something to do with that that we don't value our old people and we don't uh, invest as much in the care of uh, older people than we do of children, but but maybe maybe with this crisis there's there's greater attention and greater alarm in terms of actually what's happening in terms of the neglect of long term care institutions and services and and the situation and the sort of absence of rights of many of the workers who are doing this this work. Uh, Elisa, I have a I point. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, old people aren't as cute as kids. So I think that might have something to do with it. But my other point, which is a more serious one, is I felt, and it was pointed out to us by Penny Vera Sanso, uh, that the older generation appeared in this special issue very much as either recipients of care or providers of care. So they were either grandparents providing care to grandchildren, or they were elderly people in need of care. And that actually ignores a whole swathe of older people in the global south who have to work for a living and who have to remain economically active because there is no safety net, there is no pension. And somehow we did not manage to get uh, any contribution on that. Uh, but I think if you read the newspapers and there's uh, some research we're doing now in, uh, in Bangladesh and uh, an interview with an older woman who was divorced and trying to survive. And they said, what difference has the pandemic made to you? And she said, no difference at all. You know, I, I have to earn a living somehow and I have to do it whether there's a pandemic or not. So I found that a very, um, a very telling statement about the situation of the elderly where you do not have, where it is too much of a strain on the family to be looking after your older relatives. So they have to look after themselves. And I think that's a bit of a gap and I hope we, we manage to fill it in future issues of I think just to you know, yes, maybe say in other words what Nyla and Shara both are saying um, in terms of grandparents, you know, there has been quite a bit of shifting, I think, in both um, richer countries as well as uh, lower income countries of shifting care to unpaid grandparents. Uh, within homes and at least uh, one or two of the papers in the special issue looked closely at the care that was being provided by grandparents in the home and how uh, sometimes that exposed grandparents to risk of exposure to COVID-19 and other times it may have even protected them because they are in a home situation being looked after themselves. 
So it's a really interesting dynamic of um, and that several of our authors looked at was grandparents and how they are faring and providing labor within the home, uh, sometimes labor that um, could not be provided anywhere else. Thank you. So I have one more question uh, before we turn to questions from the audience. And this one, I want to start with Shara. So many have argued that the COVID-19 crisis has triggered a rethinking of social policies and protections. Mm -hmm. For instance, many countries have adopted temporary cash transfer programs, and some have suggested that this is a step in the direction of a universal basic income. Do you think we'll see a revolution in social policy going forward? Is this a transformative moment? Um, or like the 2008 financial crisis, do you think we'll quickly return to business as usual? Um, what would it take to make this moment transformative? That's a big question. Yeah, big question, Alyssa. <laughs> and if I could just say, <laughs> indeed, it has been, I think, for social protection. It really has been the first line of defense, as you said, and in the uh, ILO social protection monitor that uh, Jana referred to. We have been tracking the adoption of social protection measures, and we count close to 1,600 such measures being taken since. Uh, the crisis erupted, and in nearly every country. So 1,600 measures in total, but across uh, almost every country. And measures have been diverse, uh, uh, from granting you know, access to healthcare and testing and treatment to providing sickness benefits and so forth. But I think there are issues even with these responses that we have to be quite careful about. I mean, one is that the great majority of them have been temporary for maybe a few months and ad hoc. Uh, not surprisingly, the UN Women UNDP gender tracker shows that only about 8% of it has been really addressing issues uh, that we've all been talking about, about unpaid care, about provision of paid family leave, childcare services, uh, support for long-term care facilities. So that has been only 8% of this total. Um, and also, I think uh, the, the kind of uh, effort that has been made is really small compared to the kind of need that we have. It is literally a drop you know, in, in the bucket. And there are also, I think, and that's a really good question to lead to answering, um, uh, answering your other question, is about the fact that these responses that we've seen, you know, there's huge inequality in terms of how much money is going into this. From the data that we have for February 2021, so just last month, domestic fiscal measures together made up about 15.2 trillion US dollars globally. But of that, only about 0.06% has been mobilized in low income countries. So, so it's a really, really tiny fraction. And so therefore, you know, going forward, the crisis, I think, has clearly, you know, revealed that there are huge gaps in social protection systems. And this is not just for developing countries. You know, we have high income countries that, as we have seen, don't have, you know, sick pay uh, for, for employees, you know, so don't have un sufficient unemployment protection. Uh, and there are huge parts of the workforce uh, that don't have access to social security and that when they lose their jobs, they also lose access to healthcare. So, so the gaps and the deficiencies are huge. Um, but one thing this pandemic, I think, has really, really made clear is the fact that it's not just the very poor who are vulnerable and need to be part of a social protection system. Uh, although there are huge inequalities in terms of class and race and you know, your type of employment and so forth, I think there is a kind of need for a universal social protection system that can kick in and protect everyone when the need arises. Um, and, and I think here it's really important to say that it has exposed the shortcomings of relying on these very thin, highly targeted safety nets. Uh, to, to show that these are really, uh, they have huge holes in them. And really what we need is a strong floor, a social protection floor that can cover everyone and can be a solid foundation. Uh, so the question, will we rush into fiscal consolidation as we did in 2010 uh, and, and go for this very sort of low road strategy of just having safety nets, you know, and little targeted measures when there's a crisis? Or uh, are we really going to take a deep breath and move on to a high road and invest properly in building comprehensive social protection systems. That's the million dollar question. And I think 
to build such a system, we obviously you know, need to have everyone contribute to it in terms of taxes and make it truly universal and have everyone benefit from it. So, so that I think that is pretty clear that if we want to make social protection systems future proof, that's where we need to go. Now, I think the question is uh, really around the question of fiscal policies and macroeconomic policies and the kind of resource envelope that we have. And in developed countries, you know, we do see in Europe in particular that there's been a sea change in terms of a response to this crisis compared to the previous, the 2008 crisis. And sort of the old rule books have been thrown out and, and, and governments are spending big time. For developing countries, it is, it is a much more complicated question. Uh, and I think here, in addition to emphasizing that all countries, even low income countries, have ca and can increase the fiscal space for social protection by increasing taxation, having larger social security contribution base and accommodative kind of macroeconomic frameworks, we also know that we need to have a real change in the global financial architecture for developing countries to be able to do that kind of domestic resource mobilization. And by that, I don't just mean developed countries paying ODA and aid, but much more importantly, to really come up with an, a sort of international cooperation on tax matters, for example, so that you don't have tax havens and countries don't lose money in the way that developing countries are currently doing. And also making sure multinational corporations are getting properly taxed, which currently they manage to avoid taxation through profit shifting and developing countries really pay a huge price for that. And really being able to turn the tide of illicit financial flows, which again requires global cooperation. So, so yes, th th there is, in fact, there is austerity already for many developing countries who are not able to mobilize the resources. And this we know from the way in which the fiscal response has been so unequal across countries. But the answer really does lie, I think, for developing countries in particular, in being able to sort of reform the global financial architecture. So it's a, it's a huge task. In, in terms of, can I ask you a follow-up question? <laughs> Since you are, you know, you, you work within the UN system, do you, have you noticed a change in the sort of tenor of country government negotiations and uh, uh, greater openness to changing the international financial architecture to getting some of these um, uh, ideas through, you know, in terms of taxing multinational corporations and things yeah. like that? You know, yeah, yeah, there is, there is, I mean, and I'm sure my co-authors can also uh, come in on this, but there is certainly a, a lot of talk, a lot of activity going on, uh, particularly within the, the UN system, the Secretary General uh, and Member States. Uh, there is a lot of work going on now leading to the uh, Financing for Development meeting, which happens in, in, in April, uh, around really trying to address the financial, the global financial architecture, uh, Jamaica and Canada are co-leading on a very big initiative to try and see uh, some changes in the global financial architecture and engage the international financial institutions uh, to be part of this important sort of process of change. Um, so I think there's a lot more appetite and a lot more energy um, and, uh, and purpose uh, and need. One can see that in, 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 the, system, in the UN trying to move it forward. I mean, you know, UNCTAD, you were there uh, for many years. UNCTAD is playing a very important role, as are the UN regional commissions. Um, so that is all, I think, quite, quite positive. But, but again, I think we'll have to wait and see. A lot of it uh, will depend on the responses from major governments, what role the G20 will assume. You know, there's a lot of big politics in it as well. Um, Nyla or Yana, do either of you want to comment on the, the potential for social transformation moving forward in terms of adopting new public policy interventions? I'd yeah, like uh, to um, just throw out a, 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 an idea or, or, or something that we have been debating. And, you know, <clears throat> when Shara talks or the ILO talk about a global social floor, and then we've had a lot of conversations about a basic in income, you know, basic universal income. You know, to get a global social floor, we need a sense of solidarity, right? We need people to be willing to pay some of their tax, to pay the tax that is needed to finance a global social floor. And I feel like the basic income idea, while it has the, the, the advantage of simplicity, you know, and uh, lack of bureaucracy, it doesn't contain within it the seeds of solidarity that essential services would. So I 
feel that if we could, and again, you know, how do you persuade better off people to contribute? And I think they're much more likely to contribute if it is something that will benefit everyone. And so for me, I think, um, you know, there's always been this debate about, and they're not either or, obviously, but given that resources are limited, you know, where do you, where do you start? And I think it's simple to start with a basic income, but I think the long-term goal should be building up those essential services, you know, and investing in those essential workers uh, as a way of building something that we share. You know, in the United Kingdom, if there is one thing people are willing to pay tax towards, it's the National Health Service. You know, they may be, they may whinge and moan about paying tax about other things, but I think there is a kind of social consensus that we recognize that we all benefit from a, a, a universal health service. And I think equally we could benefit from you know, universal care services, universal educational services. So I guess that's my, and I don't know what the ILO's thoughts about these things are, uh, but I often see this debate going on about um, basic services versus, versus basic income. I think a point I wanted to add, um, you know, when we talk about transformational policies, um, in, um, almost explicit in this is, you know, government policies. I don't want to let employers off the hook. I do think that employers are also responsible um, for changing norms, for changing their practices and their policies and for ending some of the stigmas that they are responsible for, especially you know, the stigmatization of care work and pushing care work in the home and penalizing, especially women who do more of it. So I do think we need to look for employers as well for providing more um, policies and practices that are conducive to this overlap between um, paid work and unpaid work for men and women and having less stigma associated with people taking advantage of these kind of policies. And not only telework, which now is much more common for people who can do it for jobs that are amenable to working from home, but things like job sharing, flexible schedules, and other um, kinds of practices that are, allow this overlap between paid work and unpaid work. And if I can just Please. add a, a reflection in response to what Naila said, I think, I mean, there are two things. One is I would definitely agree. And I think the whole sort of, uh, I, I don't want to talk for the entire ILO, but the sort of norms on the, the human rights norms on social, on social protection also say that, that in fact, yes, there is when you have people contributing and there's equity in financing and solidarity in financing for services or, or transfers, uh, and everyone benefits from them. People have more incentive and more reason to pay taxes and to contribute when they know that they also benefit. And that's, I think, what has protected the National Health Service. Because yeah. as a middle-class person, maybe even yeah. you know yeah. a professional, you know, you still use the National Health Service, so you don't mind your tax money being 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 used. It's for for, for that service because you also benefit from it. It's when you have this kind of privatization happening and, and, and people, your middle classes are buying their services through the market that they will see less and they will have less incentive to pay taxes uh, if it's only tax, you know, if it's only services for the poor. So the same goes, you know, services for the poor become very poor services because you lose the political economy logic of wanting to pay taxes because you benefit from it. So that is clearly, I think that's definitely the case. But the point about services versus cash or you know, cash transfers or different kind of monetary transfers, I kind of think you need both. I mean, you, you obviously, even as, a, as an old person who is reliant on long-term care services, you also need a pension. And as a family with children, you want the services, but you also want some kind of child benefit that can you know, help you in terms of the monetary uh, side of things. So I think it should be a combination of cash and services and, and leave time and paid, you know, the time to be able 
to care. So I think that goes back to the feminist kind of formula of you need all three. Um, so, so that would be my quick answer to that. And on the employers, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Jana on that. Uh, and I think if this crisis has made one thing clear is that for the sake of continuity, business continuity, I think many more employers are also seeing the reason why it's good to have a kind of you know, social protection system that can pay you, for example, help you with paying wages when you have such disruptions uh, in, in production and in um, you know, your, uh, your, your uh, business. So there are, and there are certainly uh, responsibilities on, on the part of employers to make those kinds of contributions. Uh, and those and those responsibilities, I think, are very strongly reflected in, in, in social security systems, where both employees and employees pay into it. But then there is that cushion that everyone can fall back on when we have a crisis. And I think going forward with all the other potential for crises, whether climatic or otherwise, we really have to start, you know, taking very seriously the need for investment in these systems. So we just have a few minutes left and I uh, to the fireside chat. And there was one question about the, the kind of the geographical coverage, right, of the contributions and submissions. And in particular, and I was looking at the list, we, we talked a lot about different regions of the world, but um, we haven't touched on any contributions from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And I know that we do have a, uh, one of our articles is on the role of grandparents comparing the UK and South Africa. Uh, but do you want to just comment on the, the sort of the geographical distribution of submissions and how, and what your perspective on that was as guest editors? Um, I do know that um, we got a, a lot of submissions and one of the most important criteria that we used for, you know, prioritizing abstracts was both the um, country uh, from the author, the author where their affiliation was, um, and as well as the coverage of their article. So we really tried our best to have authors from all parts of the globe, as well as the subjects, you know, of their study be from all over the globe. And I think if there were shortages of coverage of topics, it was probably because people were data constrained, you know, hence your articles on um, sub-Saharan uh, African countries. Um, and I think other gaps, not only in terms of region, but topic, we um, wanted to do more on domestic violence and intimate partner violence, and found that surprisingly few articles covered that because there wasn't a lot of data. So when I think of data gaps, I think um, data on domestic violence and intimate partner violence is something we need more of, as well as more intersectional kind of data. And we also found kind of a lack of uh, submissions, a few, but not many, taking an intersectional approach, not only with race and ethnicity, but also things like disability and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. So we had wanted to see more work with an intersectional approach, you know, as well as uh, country coverage. I don't know, Shara and Nyla, did you want to add to that? No, you're right. And I think it really did highlight a kind of north-south, um, you know, gap in capacity to get data passed. You know, so I think there were definitely certain countries which were very quick off going. I mean, the US was great. You know, there was a lot of stuff coming out of the US and the UK. But I think, yes, there was huge gaps in geographical coverage. And I think it reflected um, the absence of, uh, of, of data, just the data, which is again an intensification of what we see normally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're coming up on uh, the end of the period. And so I'm uh, going to close out by thanking everyone for coming today. I think it was wonderful. 
uh, wonderful format and the contributions were really interesting. I learned a lot. I also wanted to remind folks, because I, I did get a couple of questions about this, that the art, all the articles for the special issue are free access. So if you navigate to uh, the publisher's site, or you could just do a search for feminist economics, and the list of latest articles are there, and they will be free access to everyone through July 2021. As I noted at the beginning, the special issue proper uh, will be published next week, meaning you can go on the site and see the whole paginated, wonderful table of contents and everything. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. It was a great conversation. I look forward to more. Thank you. And thank you, Alyssa, for organizing this. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alyssa. And thank you and to James. great co-authors yeah. and co-editors. <laughs> Events committee. Thank you. Be well.